The Trilogy Podcast with Vin and Scott. Putting the buff back in film buff. Ah! Back to school. Back to school. To prove to dad that I'm not a fool. I got my lunch packed up. My boots tied tight. I hope I don't get in a fight. Trilbit oh, number eight. To taking you back to, to school. school. Movies from the classroom. Y'all about to get schooled. All right, that was a little creepy how you said what? that. <laughs> I mean, we are, you know, doing a trill bit now because we want to take advantage of the back to school occasion. Yeah. As it were. Summer is over. Summer has finally come to an end. Kids are kids are back at school. And after a bit of a disappointing trilogy and missing in action, we felt like we owed it to you, the consumer of our podcast, to bring you something a bit more relevant. So Yes. And you are. know, uh, I mean after the dumbness of that last the movie, exactly. why not center something on education? We've you know? gotta educate you, frankly. Yes. You lost we all lost brain cells in dealing with messing in action and for sure. Chuck Norris. So now is the time to get a few back. Yes. Now we kind of broke it into two categories, right? We wanted to just kind of riff a little bit about movies that had to do with school. Mm. Um we wanted we left college movies out of it, right, Scott? Um, yeah, mostly uh, uh, most of the movies that I've uh, selected are mostly high school related. Yeah, I feel like high school or younger. College is really its own genre of film, frankly. Animal House, yeah. Revenge of the Nerds, or these Van kinds of Wilder, things. Van Wilder, any of those kind of... They're their own things. So let's leave those guys They're out They're usually the romps, like a, a comedy, a sexual comedy romp okay. sort of okay. thing. Whereas high school what? stuff is more coming of age and coming to terms. Frankly, and... we will have... A, uh, a trilogy high school romp down the road with Porky's once we get to it. Oh, yeah. We're not excited necessarily to get to it. Well, no. But, um, but we will. But make no mistake about it. It illustrates that these school-related movies are very much at the forefront of the pop cultural zeitgeist. Ah! Well, definitely relatable because everyone goes to school. No question about yeah, it. Everyone has an awkward time in high school, and that's most of these movies are around that time period. So for our purposes, we kind of split these in half. Scott covered the comedic films, yes? Yes. And I covered the uh, movies that are what I like to call inspirational teacher film. So you know what? Um, you can go first. There's a couple of exceptions to the rule that we like I wrote down that are kind of neither thing. Sure. Right? So it's worth mentioning when we talk about school films and back to school, I think. Breakfast Club? For my generation, Mr. Cagney. Yeah. Breakfast Club is iconic in terms of what it meant to be a kid, basically. Yeah. And how we thought adults perceived us wrongly. Yeah. Didn't really see us in the right way. Kind of putting themselves in those categories and try, or trying to fight out of those categories that you easily get put into in high school of the nerd, the jock, the, you know, the categories crazy that were kind of laid down when those kids, parents were kids in the fifties. Right. When you really got a sense of the jock and those, you know, those different groups within the school. Right. And it's almost like the eighties generation rebelling against that. Are we really that? Right. Or are we just the same kind of kid ultimately? And that's kind of how, how breakfast club yeah. ends sort of redefining yourself. Sure, you know? we're a bit, we're all a bit of everything. Yeah, and so for kids, it was def a defining film. But I think adults now, and even myself, when I look back at that film, see it as a little bit bullshitty, a little bit. All right, kids. Yeah, and, get, yeah, get and, real. And and because I think it's, I mean, I think John Hughes was kind of speaking for himself through these characters, sure. but like it's a little whiny from everyone. Sure. Like ultimately, it resonates, but you know, at the same time, there's a little bit of transparency there. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we were all whiny kids in high school. That's like, part of the growing up process, too. Yeah. Right? So, and you get older and you realize it. Right. You know, I have just as many feelings as you do, and it hurts just as much when somebody steps all over them. God, you're so pathetic. I don't know if this... Uh, I mean, it's definitely a high school movie, but it's a different high school movie. Carrie. It's not a comedy. It's, it's not a... Uh, I wouldn't call that a high school movie. While but it certainly is. It's born of that, like being picked on in high school. True, but and having it, a power that you can and the climax takes place at the prom, of course. Yeah, but it, you really have to call Carrie a horror. But it does deal get with it. sort of the same subject matter in a very You're different right. way. You're right, in a, from the horror perspective. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that was my one that it doesn't really quite make the comedy. Well, list, you know, but... tack tack a couple onto those. Tack on Harry Potter. Because while that, again, takes place in school, that's a fantasy right. film, obviously. Right, because it's not a school that we all went to. We okay. didn't go to the same school. Sure, so while some of the themes are the same, right. and that's actually the thing that makes it so fantastic, that 
you have a fantastical element that confronts some of the very themes that we as students confronted to. Right. Right? Harry, Harry Potter! Welcome back! Did you have a good summer? No! Voldemort's returned and he's trying to kill me! Again! And I actually, I found there's some subcategories in my category. Oh, one really? of them, which Good. I guess I'll just start with this one, yeah. one of them is more uh, not focused on the kids, you know, uh, not focused, uh, more teacher centric or or not necessarily teacher. And in those categories, I would put uh, back to school, which is more focused okay. on the old, the, the, you know, the conceit of the movie is that it's this old guy with the kids. It's no not question. about the kids and their education. So, so that's your college movie. Yes, that's the college movie. Yeah. Back to you school. know what? But it's called back to it's school. It's called back so to school. So you have to, use, that's yeah. the reason we're allowing it. Right. It's called yes. back to school, for yes. God's sake. Yes. So no, that makes sense. Yeah. And so much of it is Rodney Dangerfield interacting with the world of education. Right. That's so, the goof. Is sure. that like, oh, what if this guy were all of a sudden at a college? No at question. a party. No like, question. That no, that's fair. That's yeah. a fair addition. And uh, also on that line of thinking, a school of rock. Ah. Is also because it's more centric on Jack Black and his character and but his arc of. That's a school movie, no question. Yeah, it's a school for sure. comedy. Most of it happens in the classroom. Listen, my friends, so many people came up to me and they're like, "How do you feel about Jack Black stealing your career?" As a as a working artist, as a working actor and director, much of my rent paying money has been made over the years as a substitute teacher, almost twenty years of sub teaching. Yeah. So I did that very type of thing. I would, I I don't know. I, I don't. I know that I'd inspire kids so much, but instead of being the musician, I was like the drama guy that would go into these schools and try and do my thing. Yeah. Well, people used to ask me that about Seth Rogen. Yeah. They're like, how, how, how does it feel to have the guy steal your fucking career? And I was, kind of your act. Yeah, definitely. I like, yeah, I guess, but... Yeah, but... I mean, listen, you're a little bit... You approach Seth Rogen from a couple of directions, but you're not really... No one yeah. would say, oh, you're like Seth Rogen. I had a guy at a party tell me one time, he's like, oh, I can't... You sit, you just like look and sound so much like him. And I was like, no. oh, I don't really think I do. And he was like, oh, I can't take it. The voice, man. There's some... And he like ran on the other side of the party. And I was like, the fuck was no that way. all There's some like... minor subtleties to your voice that are Rogan-esque. Yeah. And some minor things about your look that are Rogan-esque. <laughs> He sounds like fucking, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember, Ah uh, Real Monsters. You'd be, you would have been, that would have been way past no. your time. Um, that was almost past my time. Uh, but there was a, a character named Crumb. Okay. Who would hold his own eyeballs. He was a monster. Yeah, I've seen that. And he that was like stinky or whatever. Creature, but yeah. he laughed exactly like fucking, say, he sounds like Seth Rogen. If they ever do an Ah uh, Real Monsters movie, he should either voice or play the live action version right. of Crumb. Okay. And the same, like, <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mean Girls, Great got the film. Got very very funny movie. A uh, movie that from the outside definitely looks like it's just gonna be you know some teen drama or like something like that. Sure, very funny oddball kind of comedy about growing up in high school and especially the female perspective. Definitely. Um, there's a couple of those on this list. I think that was a groundbreaking film, and it really, in a lot of ways, catapulted the careers of Tina Fey and that age group of SNL. Stars, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's all that you know. Yeah, like Tim Meadows is in it, exactly. And yeah, yeah. Tim Meadows is in like every. Amy SML Poehler is in it as off. well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so because they're that's when they're friends. getting their start, but she's really also making a really great point. Film and again. I'm not a teen girl. I'm not looking to get all deep with the right. I I, I really thought I wasn't gonna like it, and then yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. It's uh, very funny. Yeah. I have not seen. There's the musical now. Mean uh, Girls on Broadway. I haven't heard. One of my students, I heard one of my good. students is all about that musical. Okay. Yeah. I'm kind of like, oh, whatever. So I just resent in that. general. They're just, they're making just musicals hurly burly based upon things that already exist. Yeah. Say nothing of the fact that it's not a musical. Right. So, all right. Why, why not just have Tina Fey write uh, another musical? Thanks. If you're going to write yeah. eight original songs, or however many, 12, yeah. however many there are, write an original plot around right. it. The hardest part is the songs, yeah. not the plot. Can you imagine instead of if, if fucking the guys from South Park had written just South Park the it, musical instead of doing Book of Mormon, which exactly. was a huge hit? Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that does it. Screw you guys, I'm going home. Uh, then there's the kind of oddball, really weird, awkward, really lean into the awkwardness, Napoleon Dynamite, uh, which is, you know, just an incredibly awkward movie. It takes place in both the 80s and the time it was made, the early 2000s. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, weird aesthetic to it. A um, rural world. Like sort of Midwesty, yeah. sort of. Uh, completely original, completely quirky and I guess charming. Maybe it was, was it Southwesty? I forget. Where that was, uh, it was Idaho. Are you going to eat your tots? Um, but funny movie. Um, yeah. Good movie. 
I think it has, uh, you know, a strong, like, impactful message. It's, it, it ends up being inspiring, but even though you don't you think over it the will. Head with it was right. Just it kind of just showed that sometimes the guy that you think is the biggest loser has the most in him, and that's all. Right. The theme yeah. doesn't have to get deeper than that. You right. don't have to kill me at the end of that. It's dance a loser number. becoming a hero. That's yeah. Zero to hero story. Very simple. Exactly. And honestly, he he makes uh, he his next movie was uh, another Jack Black, uh, Nacho Libre was made by the same guy who did Napoleon Dynamite. Is that right? And it's basically the same story of like a loser who's trying to prove himself sort of thing. Okay. But, but those those movies are always great. They're always fun to watch because you're like, yeah, like rooting for the underdog. 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 Then we get into our, our literary-based high school comedies. Go ahead. Which, of course, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You. I don't really... Is that a girl movie? I don't... I've never seen I that. I think it is more so, but it was more like a, Amy uh, knows a late... Amy about that movie. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, it was sort of a late... Like, it played on cable a lot, like TBS or one of those, okay. bought it and played it constantly. I hate your big, dumb combat boots and the way you read my mind. I hate you so much it makes me sick. It even makes me rhyme. Uh, Ten Things I Hate About You is based on Taming of the Shrew. Ah. Uh, so the plot is basically that this guy wants to date the younger girl, but the father won't let her unless... It's the exact plot okay. of Taming of the Shrew. So they enlist Heath Ledger to woo... Julia Stiles. Love him. In Julia Stiles. Yes. Ah. Yes. Um, who is sort of, she's like the Kate Ugh. in Taming of the Shrew. Yeah. Very hard, very not interested in him. A friend of mine that was a dancer forced me to go see Julia Stiles in that, that dancing movie. Uh, Save the Last Save Dance. Save the Last Dance. Yeah. Yeah, it was awful. That's That that was a big girl movie. That's you notice movie it's mostly movies of. about dancing and sexy dancing are very big hits with women. Because And then, of course, also a, a literary uh, uh, school movie, uh, one of the best ones, I think, Clueless, Okay. really commented on the 90s and that no kind of time period, while being the classic story of her trying to hook that guy up, and then he wants to be with her. It's really the iconic teen film of the 90s, I would say. Really? Yeah. It really speaks for the link between the, the strangeness of the 80s and the contemporary you know, yeah. millennium we're in now. Right. You know, the post-2000... Yeah. You know, millennial. Well, it being world. based on, I believe it's based on, is it Emma? Yeah, Emma. It is based on Emma. All right. Yeah, but definitely quintessential high school, especially like that Valley Girl kind of thing that was very popular at the time. Well, it also, I think, speaks for the region of the country, too. West Coast, California, right. all the way. Wow. You guys talk like grown ups. Oh, well, this is a really good school. And then you got a movie that's uh i think most famous for being uh him not going to school and what's that ferris bueller's day off which but it is, is distinctly a high school movie though. definitely the, concerns... the, the principal of the high school is chasing him the whole movie right. it's definitely a school movie well the principal of the high school i uh, like to chase boys that particular yeah. principal <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 sometimes the, you know you miss the signs jeffrey you jones Word is in Hollywood, he paid them to play that role. And yuck, yuck, yuck. Gooey. That is why I have got to catch him this time. To show these kids a body. Oh, Dad. But great movie. Yes, no question Great movie about, about uh, Chicago, too. It's a great yeah. Chicago movie. Um, but and yeah, the, it really discusses the thing of, like, getting ready to leave and go on to college and become an adult and that kind of transitional period. It also examines the idea of the... You don't want to say campus because it's it's high school, but big man on campus. The right. one famous guy, he's yeah. the Van Wilder before there's a Van Wilder. He's the Van Wilder in, when he's in high school. Right. That one well-known guy in high school. But, but, but the same of Van Wilder. Van Wilder was afraid to move on. And he's sure. kind of the thing of like, I don't want to grow up. I kind of want to keep doing this. You match those two movies together, really. You can yeah. really put those together. And those are like the growing up and figuring, you know. Yeah. Um, you want to say um, delayed... Maturity yeah, type of movies, like, uh, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Regression. Arrested Development. Arrested Development. That's the expression I'm looking for. Yeah. Arrested Development. No question. Good job. I guess that's better than de delayed regression or whatever <laughs> pseudoscientific... Failure to launch. <laughs> ...rhetoric I was speaking of. It's Arrested Development. We're like... seeing a lot of connections here, Scott. Do you yeah. get it? Yeah. And I think you're going to see even more... We could definitely break these into the solid categories. And I, I think you can see it even more when we get into my world now, the inspirational teacher. You're done, right, with your comedy? Yep, I'm all set. So That's check it out, thing. okay? Here's how I, once I did the research, broke it down. There are three periods of time where a bunch of these movies were made all in a cluster, okay? In the late 80s, you had right one on top of another. First, you had Stand and Deliver, okay? Yes. Which is Edward James Almost. 
He's teaching kids the AP. Yeah. It's really a crazy story because the notion of teaching kids that barely know standard skills for math, the AP, is insane. Yeah. So suggestion this guy really did it and it really worked goes to the theme of that film, which is basically kids will reach what level you teach them, you decide to teach them. If you perceive them as being low level, they're only going to reach that standard that you create. Right. So you know, the sky's he, the limit, so to speak. He's a badass in that movie, too. Academy Award nominee. Yeah. Playing, um, what they call them, chemo. Yeah. Escalante. All right. I mean, I can't think of another role he's had that's as big. Uh, well, certainly impactful. not as iconic. Yeah. You know, Edward James almost famous for the Miami Vice TV show, really, yeah. before that. And he had a really uh, important role in, uh, he did American Me. Well, he also, I mean, later was the uh, commander in, of the Battlestar Galactica in the remake show. You had to nerd it up, didn't yeah, you, Scott? I did. Because he's a badass in it. Yeah, he's re- well respected from what yeah. I gather, right? Galactica actual. Like, he's just so <laughs> intense. How do I reach these kids? Now, uh, this, the very next year in 1989, you had a different type of inspirational teacher. This one wasn't trying to inspire poor kids to do better. He was trying to do the opposite. Inspire rich kids to loosen up. And that's Robin Williams in the Dead Poet Society. Yes. He's basically saying, you're not locked into this world your parents have created for you, this yeah. Rich, class, heavy world. Yeah. Go to a cave. Say some poetry. Yeah. I Talk to that, girls. I think Dead Poets Society is really an overrated inspirational teacher film, but it's one of the most iconic inspirational teacher films. And a great films. performance. Great oh, performance yeah. by Robin Williams, another yeah. um, Academy Award nominated uh, performance for him. I believe that is his second nomination after Good Morning, Morning Vietnam. Vietnam. Good Morning Vietnam! The third one. Again, right in this period of time, also 1989, Lean on Me. Yeah. Okay? And that's where you have yeah. Morgan, Morgan Freeman, Freeman having to take a hard stance. Um, that's in a uh, difficult pa- Patterson, Patterson, New school. Jersey. Yep. Yeah, Patterson, New Jersey, the East Side High School, where I've actually worked, been inside. Yeah. I know Patterson very well. And it's, it's an open secret in the city that the whole movie's a lie. Yeah. That the only reason that the kids actually pass that standardized test is on the day of the test. They were told to stay home, the ones that weren't going to pass, so that it could pass. Yeah. That he's really wasn't, that Joe Clark wasn't a good guy. Well, he's not really portrayed as a good guy in the film. Not really, He's redeemed yeah. at the end, in a way. Sure, but, but he's kind of tough. He's not likable. He's, you know, I mean, you know, the the uh, the ends justify the means, sort of, in sure. this movie. But, yeah. Okay. It's different than Stand and Deliver in that he's not trying to inspire their minds to get them to leave this cycle of poverty. He's basically right. saying... Things have gotten so bad, I've got to be hard as hell yeah. and just break it down to these Yeah, you think it's bad now, I'll make it much worse, right. basically. Right. So you're seeing that this is, 88 um, through 89, you had three movies that took on the idea of the inspirational teacher in completely different ways. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you get really close, and you circle, as we get into the next period of time, the trope of the white savior narrative. A lot of people talk about that. Um, yeah. In a lot of different settings in film some of this is overblown and is a little bullshitty some of it is true i think that the way it's applied in in the in the idea of films about students and teachers isn't really true yeah because most of the time it's a black or minority teacher that rolls in but one of the examples that they always give is dangerous minds okay yes a dangerous minds um came out in 1995 and that's the second phase of teacher movies the yeah. mid 90s this is where you might start to really remember these movies a yeah. lot more scott well, right? this was kind of a big deal that movie well gangster's paradise was the number one hit song yeah and okay. it was on every single trailer for the movie yes it was yeah this was um similar to lean on me again that she was um what's her name uh, uh michelle pfeiffer was a former marine uh instructor or something oh. and she came in very hard with them like i'll kick your ass that kind of a thing yeah so in the you same don't scare w- me similar to joe clark in, in the lean on me yeah tough woman so she earns the respect through toughness herself right okay but that was another really bullshitty example of this right that let me tell was. you that as someone who's worked as a substitute teacher and teacher for 20 years in some of the toughest schools in new york and new jersey none of this is reality right these people don't exist though some of the time these are based on real stories this is a teacher that like it takes them a long time, often years, to make any kind of impact in that school and to earn the trust of the students in that school. These films, it seemingly happens overnight. 
with one scene or one thing that they do, one major flourish. Yeah. It doesn't happen that way. Yeah. I can tell you. I've tried to inspire kids. I've tried to inspire a room full of tough black kids, tough Spanish kids. Me being this lily white guy, creative drama guy, with I think all kinds of great tools at my disposal. It's incredibly difficult. Yeah. Because you're not from their world. Right. You don't have their common They don't shared trust experience. you. You have, right. to build, you have to build trust with them. But, but it, you have to do it in a different way because right. whereas a, a black teacher can get in front of the kids and say, I come, it's very common. You hear this a lot. They'll use, I come from your neighborhood, guys. I know what you're about. Right. Fine. I can't do that. So I have to come from a different perspective. Hey, guys, here's a different way of looking at stuff. Right. That's kind of how I did it. Okay. From this period of time, 1995 to 95, you had dangerous minds. And then you had a different inspirational teacher. Mr. Holland in oh, Mr. Holland's Opus. Mr. Holland's Opus. There's a theme here that these are often Academy Award nominated roles. Michelle Pfeiffer was not nominated for an Academy Award. But let me tell you, Richard Dreyfus was for this. Yeah. All right. Just as Robin Williams. He, and as he should have been. That, Edward that's a James great movie. Almost. Real tearjerker. Yeah. Really screams like, you will cry at the end of this. Yeah. In our, this last scene, we will make you cry. And uh, what's her face to play his wife, the late uh, Glenn Headley? Glenn Headley? Right. Exactly. Um, and she she was the one who made me cry the most in that movie when sure. the kid's trying to get the thing out of the cabinet and she's like, I want to talk to my son. Like, That's I the whole like, thing. <laughs> it's inspirational in that we learn not necessarily that, that this man is inspirational from the perspective of his students right. seeing him, but rather you see him at home, his family. It's about right. the teacher, not the students. Yeah, And he's inspirational because you see what makes him inspirational as a man. Not just that the students are suddenly achieving. Yeah. You see what kind of his, his world, this is an artist who is forced to do this. Yeah. And so how does he, listen, as a teacher, I, I've confronted so many of these issues myself. Right. But, you know, those who can't do teach, I can still do. Yeah. But here I am teaching. Right. Is my w- life worth something? Is it? Yeah. Well, I'm not as old as Mr. fucking Holland was. No. And I wasn't trying to write the American Symphony. But at the same <laughs> the time. The great American Symphony. When you hear it, you're like, okay. You're like, oh, it's pretty good, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that ruffle of drums yeah. is a little. Uh... <laughs> a little <laughs> too much, if you ask me. <laughs> um, yeah. But I mean, it also, it, the interesting thing about that movie, too, is not just. Like, he's great with the kids that he teaches, but he can't reach his own son, you know? Well, Because he's sort of, there's sort of, like, the resentment that he's such a, a music guy and this kid is deaf. That's the whole thing. You know, like, so it's almost like, like, you get to watch his whole life and watch him just be tortured by, like, it the really, things it, that he loves. It's like, it's like a terrible story about a guy. Yeah. yeah. That's what's sad it's about it. It's less inspirational as than it is. I mean, the whole thing at the end is that, like, right. we love you, Mr. Holland, and okay, you made but, such but a difference. But up until that time, it's sad because it's a pity oh party. You feel bad for the yeah, guy. Yeah, you're like, Jesus Christ. It's like, yeah, I get you. But he's lo- also kind of an asshole in the movie, too. But I like that well, about the movie. So you love your... I gotta tell you that because he's part, Richard Dreyfus, he's gonna be an he's, asshole. Where the guy he's signing and there's lights and that he's singing the John Lennon yeah. song. Like, beautiful, beautiful. The hell is going beautiful. on here? I tried to picture it, the son not being able to hear any of it, just watching Richard just, Dreyfus with a goddamn street light next to him, yeah. signing, and I'm like, I don't know. Well, that kid, that that one actor who plays this kid like as a teen, like he reacts, he doesn't react at all. Like yeah. he's just like looking right at him, I'm like, are we sure he can hear him or understand the sign language? Because He's got no reaction whatsoever. So you have these two films in 95, which that's the next phase, all right? Yeah. And the final phase I found to be in the mid-2000s, okay? Yes. And these can, again, mostly be categorized by a teacher coming in to, to usually a bunch of tough urban kids changing everything. Yeah. 2007, uh, you had Freedom Writers, Hilary Swank. Another example of the, uh, the white savior narrative she gets a bunch of inner city kids to start <clears throat> journaling and writing oh. about their experiences. And that's what changes everything. And what if you can't rap a lyric or dribble a ball? You know what's going to happen when you die? You're going to rot in the ground. Swank, though, is the last lily white person to try and inspire a bunch of urban kids. Because you also have, in 2006, Antonio Banderas in Take the Lead, where he uses dance oh, yeah. to inspire a bunch of kids. <laughs> you have 2007, Denzel Washington using debate to inspire a bunch yes. of kids. Yes. You have Lawrence Fishburne using spelling in 2006 <laughs> to inspire Aquila in Aquila in the B. And, and the just bee. when you thought that every single African American actor was represented, no, because Samuel L. Jackson at that same time in 2005 has to inspire kids with Coach Carter. And while that might be kind of a sports movie, 
it just illustrates that if you're a hardcore African-American actor, you're doing a movie where you play a teacher. And ultimately, most of these films are pretty good. Yeah. If a bit of a stretch. They're great from a dramatic perspective, but they're not great from any kind of realistic perspective. Yeah. So it's really nice to see the underdog, these tough kids, warm up to this teacher right. and, you know, create a bond Gain with this a, a teacher. A mutual respect. Reform their lives. Yeah. Well, because everyone's had an inspirational teacher, and if they haven't, they wanted one. <laughs> no question. You know what I mean? So, like, you're going to enjoy watching the movie and being like, oh, I wish I had that. But to you us, know? the inspirational teacher was just the teacher that wasn't an asshole. Right. That was, like, the funny teacher. Like, the funny right. teacher. Yeah. Now, we know usually, looking back, the funny teacher, that funny social studies teacher, was really the creepiest teacher you probably had. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was really the yeah. mean English or math teacher you probably learned the most from and was really the inspiration. Yeah. As kids, we don't see that. Right. We just think that the social studies teacher is funny. Like, whoa, he's, he's cool. He's cool. No. Whoa, he's smoking a joint with us behind the school. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> like, that ain't right. Mr. Handel would hang out with us and he would tell us awesome jokes. And he actually hooked up with one of the students. Um, and then like 12 other kids came forward. It was in all the papers. Really ruined eighth grade for us. So we just wanted to give you guys a little taste of school from the film perspective. Yeah. As you, you as you and your children and your grandchildren, we think everyone listens to this podcast of all ages. So yes. as your kids and grandkids, nieces and nephews go back to school, have a great year. Yeah. And if you're going back to school or if you're not, have a great year. Have a, you either know? Way, either have a way. great year, but we want to implore you from the perspective of two men that are always looking to teach you more and more about trilogies. Yes. Hey, let's do it. Let's have a great year. Let's do it. All right. Sign my yearbook. <laughs> I sign my boobs. P.S. <laughs> <laughs> it's Mo, what a, oh, what a crazy year it's been. <laughs> See you next summer. <laughs> hey,